Um, I think that we do have to, or we'll have some time to open up to Q, uh, questions from the audience. Good. If people have any questions. Um, can I ask anyone, gentlemen there, do we have a mic at all? Thanks for coming today. Just want to get your insight. If we look at the, um, the cross section of the Australian community as a whole, and then we look at the cross section of the Australian Parliament. Yes. Two different countries. Yeah, we know that there's no shortage of, of uh, candidates who are more than capable of being in that Australian Parliament. Why do you think, th think that there's a shortage of that cross section occurring through the Australian Parliament? It's a really good question, and I reckon it's probably, you know, I think it's at the heart of why people have lost faith in politics, because we've got a Parliament. <laughs> that's profoundly unrepresented. It's supposed to be a representative democracy. It doesn't represent the Australian community. You look, you, I look sometimes at, across at my colleagues and you look at the census and they're two different countries. They're two different countries. So the question is why? It's because of the institutions through which candidates, come, how, they, how they come through the system. So I want to talk about my party first, and we're a young party, we've been around since the 90s, we haven't been around that long, uh, but we made a very deliberate effort to increase the diversity within our team. So in, uh, in the Victorian Parliament, we got a Victorian election on Saturday, I won't, I won't again get on my political soapbox too much, but we've got 8 MPs, seven of them are women, we're very proud of that, the leader is a Sri Lankan woman. We've got the daughter of Vietnamese refugees. We've got the first Aboriginal woman to parliament. We've got a lot of diversity within our team. I'm proud of the fact that, you know, I'm somebody who comes from a non-English speaking background. Both my parents were migrants from Italy. Um, and we, got, we work on that. Like, that doesn't happen by accident. We're still working on it. So we've, to we've established a mentoring program where, you know, for a lot of people, politics is this mystery. You know, how do you become a politician? Well, there's no, there's no sort of, you know, training school. Well, it sort of is. I'll come to that in a minute. You work as a staffer for a you know, political party. But for most people, it's, a, it's another world. And we've got, to be, we've got to be creating pathways for people. So we've got a mentoring program. We started a fellowship. We got some support from a number of different groups. We're working with the Islamic Community of Victoria, for example. Sorry, Islamic Council of Victoria. Um, and we, we, we have young people from a range of backgrounds, uh, and we, we put them through a program, a, a, a structured program, to just let them learn a bit about how it works. And really, you know, the bottom line is you join a political party, you get active and involved, and there are different ways you can do that. And you put your hand up for pre-selection. And the members of that party vote. And our party is, is a party that is very committed to increasing diversity. So I'm speaking on behalf of the Greens, and we, you know, we just welcome Maureen Faruqi into the New South Wales, uh, New South Wales Senator. Um, uh, woman Pakistan, from Pakistan, Muslim, again, first Muslim woman to the Senate. So we're doing what we can to increase diversity in our team. And we still, we've got a lot more work to do. The bottom line is at the moment, the pathway into politics become really narrow. You go and work for a political, um, an MP, you go and work in an office as a staffer, often got no life experience, spend some time there, Someone retires, you put your hand up for pre-selection, and you end up in Parliament. Now, that's not, that's not, not going to create a system where you've got people from a wide variety of backgrounds. Um, we, um, you know, we end up with people who have got no life experience. People ask me, what should I do before, you know, I'd like to get involved. And I often say, well, go and get, go and get some experience in the world. Um, you know, there's a... Bring something to the parliament. Don't just see the parliament as, as the sort of end goal, but bring something there, come in, spend some time, make a contribution. But it's really important. We need people who, who can actually bring a whole set of life experiences into the parliament. I think the other thing now, which is actually seen play out a bit with the Victorian election, is um, the scrutiny on people has become so extreme that people who you know, who have, you know, the real people, and particularly in an age of social media, where they might have said and done stupid things and have it all recorded, it's pretty hard for them, you know, because they're going to have their life torn apart. So there's, there's that, that aspect of it. We've seen that happen just this week. That's right. <laughs> and I'm, you know, people, 
might, might be aware that that's happening at the moment with a number of cancers, including some of ours. Um, so I think that, that aspect of it makes it more difficult. The toxic media environment where people put their hand up and they get taken, to, you know, torn, torn to shreds. So that's a problem. And I, I don't have any answers to how we resolve that, except to say that I think over time, particularly as y younger people stand for, well, people who uh, have grown up with social media and have every aspect of their life documented, I think there'll have to be a, a reassessment about what we expect from political, you know, from, from our candidates, and that many of will have to be a bit more generous because you all think back to when you were a 15-year-old, I'm not the same person as when I was 15 or 20 or 25. And I'm glad, and I think most people are of my vintage, that every single stupid thing they said and did wasn't recorded and recorded forever. So that's, I think that's part of it. Um, I must admit that as I, as I sat hovering over the delete, the, t the massive tweet deleter button last night, having seen what happened yesterday with, with one public uh, shaming someone's previous tweets, I thought, oh, do we just wait the, the couple of years until it's okay to have said something that out of context sounds terrible, but was that, you know, probably just an import taste joke? Yeah. Or do we, you yeah. know, I, don't, I, don't, I, I have a little faith that that will change, unfortunately. But, um, but, I, but I, I despair for what our, our um, well, parliament will look like exactly. if we don't you're not if gonna we have real people. everyone with a sense of humour. You're not going to have uh, real people. You're not going to have real people because, you know, you'll have people whose um, life will be sanitised, people from more privileged backgrounds where that stuff is much more carefully manicured. You won't get the diversity in the parliament that we need. We need a parliament made up of real people because a lot of the decisions that are made in that place are made by people who are just a, a profoundly unrep... It's, it's shocking that we had to wait so long for marriage equality, uh, voluntary assisted dying. I could talk about a range of social issues where there's overwhelming majority support, overwhelming. And yet you've got this block of MPs that are, you know, as I said, worlds apart from where community opinion is. That's a, that is a big challenge and probably goes to the heart of one of the things that we have to address if we're going to have a parliament that works better. Open it to another question. Oh, that gentleman there. Thanks for the address, Richard. Um, my memory goes back to the end of the Second World War when our immigration program set up by a Labor government was to be based on integration and assimilation. And the Labor Party, Labor government used to claim we had the highest rate of first generation integration, in other words, marriage between migrants and, and Australians. And the, uh, we called them New Australians, you remember in those days, mm -hmm. it was kind of but it was, we want you to become an Australian. Mm -hmm. Now, I went to something run by Monash University the other week. They've dropped multiculturalism altogether. They say it's the completely wrong message. We want you to live here, but we don't want you to become Australians. We want you to stay as you are. And this is totally wrong. Now, they use the term Monash Migration and Inclusion Centre. In other words, we must give these people a chance to include. What worries me is that we're going to finish up like Europe, cities like London and Paris, where whole suburbs are African, or whole suburbs are Arab, and this leads to Mm. Mm. We I, have got to get away from the intercultural. Mm. It's better than non-cultural. Mm. But um, their opinion, this is Monash University, mm. they know what they're talking about. I think that we might be a... Be I'm happy to take that. But, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, um, let me tell you about the experience of my family. To start, just a, a bit of an anecdote. My parents came, my grandparents came on my mum's side. My dad came when he was 30. Mum came when she was a young girl. They came, family of seven Italian kids. Uh, my grandparents both came when they were in their 30s. And they settled in Brunswick. They settled amongst a community in Brunswick of people who just spoke Italian. My grandmother died a couple of years ago. She had probably, I don't know, maybe five words of English when she died. Um, they basically set up a milk bar, they served Italians, they, that, was, that was what they did. I look at her, the kids, and the kids have all been successful in their own right in different ways. They've all moved out, they're all part of 
the Australian community. Um, if we do this right, it, it happens. This idea that somehow we're going to create ghettos and African ghettos and, you know, whether they be, you know, ghettos of South Sudanese. We had the same thing with the Asians. We were told, told oh, well, the Asians, from, when it came to Southeast Asia and the settling of people from Vietnam and Cambodia, that these people would, would, wouldn't assimilate, would end up. But what we are seeing is in, in Australia where there are still very high rates of, um, uh, you know, intercultural marriage. And, and I think it's the same story that will be repeated. We have a generation of people who come here. It's not an unusual thing for people to want to be surrounded by people who share a culture. But I think there are some pretty key differences here in that Australia is and always will be, in my view, a, a country made up of people from right around the world. Uh, we are one of the most successful and have been up until recently one of the most successful countries when it comes to settlement services in providing those supports, su providing English language services, providing all of those things that actually allow that to happen. Now we're going to have an, argue about what words, an argument about what words we want to use, but I think the foundations are still pretty strong and I don't share, I don't share those concerns in the way that some people do. I think what we'll continue to see is what we've seen over many years, where often it's tough for the people who come here, but when you look at what happens over time, you start to see uh, people move into their own um, areas, uh, employment, uh, education, all of those things, they start to adopt in terms of where you, when you look at the stats, they, they basically start to look like every other member of the Australian community. So I understand the concerns, but I think, I th I think Australia's in a pretty good place to be able to deal with it. Settlement services are very important, really important. Providing those settlement services, making sure that settlement experience is a positive one. What will make it happen, or w what will threaten that, is when you have politicians stand up and demonise and create an environment where people feel they need to retreat, where they feel that they can't be part of the community because there are people in positions of leadership who don't want them to be in that role. And I think that's what we've got to guard against. And I was going to say, the, the flip side of, of that kind of um, fear, fear of different population group, mm. you know, quote-unquote enclaves, is that there are many places in Australia that are still predominantly white, that don't have a lot of, a, a lot of experience of, of, of those other cultures. Mm. And we're slowly seeing that change as well, but that's, that's a very slow change. Like, yeah. there, are, there are definitely lots of places in, you know, country Australia that are, you know, don't have the same experience that, you know, me as a very inner north person has a, of different, <laughs> different cultures and, you know, right. having, having grown up in Box Hill and, and places like that. Um, I do know that we had a, a gentleman over there who had a, a question just behind that gentleman. Thank you. Uh, so my question is about employment and unemployment. I find very surprising that when we hear employment stats that unemployment is only 5% and about 95% of Australians are in employment, and when I go around in migrant communities, the unemployment rate is as high as 40%, 50%. If you look at Muslim women, I think the unemployment rate is about 60 70%. Uh, Muslim men, the employment rate is about 30 40%. If I can um, go to Asian communities, again, the stats is as mm. high, may not be as high, but still it's about 20, 30%. So where are all these stats coming from? Where, why can't we have a proper debate about employment and unemployment? How do we move people <coughs> from unemployment into employment rather than all these other issues? Because if we have the money and we have the jobs, I think we can pay for it. Good question. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a PhD student and what I do is I, um, my thesis is about multiculturalism in the workplace, mm. specifically about professional services. Sorry, we can just get you to bring that up a bit. So basically what you've got, you've got an underground basically working against mm. this multicultural thing, mm. that the politicians are undermining at the top, but it almost sounds like it gives permission to employers 
to sidestep uh, EEO legislation, racism, the Racism Act from 1975, those sorts of things, and still be able to get away with it because people are intimidated and don't complain because they're frightened of losing the job that they have. Our students graduate from uh, Australian universities, international students uh, may, um, graduate from our universities. They fall by the wayside and either take jobs in 7-Eleven or bookkeeping jobs or, you know, there is a talent pool there that is not being utilised, that is fully qualified and don't get the same career opportunities and, and promotions because they were born overseas. Yeah. Yeah, it's, a, it's a really good point. It's really, really yep. difficult to, yep. to really combat that. Yep. I was an HR manager for many years and now I'm an academic. I'm trying to find evidence-based uh, data to make sure that there's something that we can do on the grassroots that makes this immoral. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll just a couple of... I agree. I mean, I agree with you. I think that's, that, that is a real problem. We all know you probably hear the stories about people who put their CVs in blind. You know, you put your name Muhammad, you're less likely to get a job, put the same CV in to the, for the same job, you're much more likely to get a job. So there is that bias built in, no question about it. I suppose I'd probably just say a couple of things about unemployment. 5% is the nominal unemployment rate. There's a lot, a lot of people are underemployed, right? So there's a lot of people who are working a few hours a week uh, who are classified as employed, but actually they're underemployed and they're still not captured in that. So even though that's the nominal rate, it is higher. Um, but it is, I mean, that's, that has to be where the focus is. I mean, if we got away from this, we, you know, us and them mentality, this divide and conquer mentality, that's exactly what you'd be doing. You'd be putting the investment into address the systematic bias that is within the system. It's hard to do that, and that's really the domain of um, trying to build that evidence base to make sure we, we, we put in place initiatives that deal with it. And we're... This is part of the Multicultural Commission, by the way, and having a, having a body, a legislated body, that says um, we're going to put in place reporting around employment. You know, in the same way as we started to shift the dial a bit on gender, we're still a long way behind, we've got to do the same in, in terms of cultural diversity. And so this would be the work of a Multicultural Commission federally, is to really name this and work out what are the specific interventions we need to make so that we don't, so we address that bias that's built into the system. Um, and if we get that right, then everything else follows from there. So I'm with you, I agree, I support, I support the proposal. Unfortunately, the prerequisite for that is we want to make this work and we're not going to exploit it for base politics, which is what's going on at the moment. And I would say that there's, there's, there's two things as well, and one of them is really hard to combat against, which is, uh, as much as we can put in policy solutions and, and we, we know that there have been places where they've, they've piloted completely blind uh, CVs and, and, and cover, letter, cover letters with some success and, and in some circumstances unfortunately not because people's biases can still creep through and they can read between the lines sometimes. Um, but the, the part of the problem is that personal uh, unconscious bias um, and it's a hell of a thing. Um, if, and that's about taking responsibility for your own, uh, you know, as, you know, say, a you know, white European background uh, employer and acknowledging it because it's all fine and well to be publicly a good person and you know, doing all the right things, but you actually have to do the work as well. Mm. Can I just make one additional comment on mm. the BMC, the mm. Victorian Multicultural Commission? Mm. Uh, my personal experience has been that this kind of fails the multicultural community. Most of the people that are running it are political appointees. Mm. Every time the government changes, yeah. the political kind of work is getting yeah. Yeah. And sorry. Uh, so the, there's a lot of political appointments on those kind of boards, and they kind of uh, are shifting the people from one end of the spectrum to other end of the spectrum without actually understanding what's going on. So if you look at the media coverage um, over the past 10, 15 years that I've been uh, observing it, the very, very biased media coverage. VMC has never taken a position on one single yeah. of such postings. Yeah. Uh, I've approached them so many times. You look at the multicultural minister, or whoever it is, whether it's from labor, mm -hmm. liberal, does not matter. Mm -hmm. They're all um, kind of from the cut from the same kind of board. Um, when you ask them that, what is VMC doing and why are they not tackling this? And they always say, oh, but we are giving $500 to this community or $10,000 to that. In fact, they use money um, to divide the communities, pitch one against another. So how is the federal kind mm -hmm. of thing? Is it, 
is going to be different. Independent or, appointment, just like the ABC. Statutory I was going to say, um, we've got the same problem with the ABC at the moment. We've got political appointment of the ABC board. You, you've got to get away from that model. It's got to be, it's got to be um, t a complete arm's length from politics. But politicians don't like giving up power. You know, so it's in both their interests. We get in, we'll change it. You get in, you can change it. We need to actually have separation. You've got to have an independent statutory body where the board's appointed. Yeah. So that would be my response to that. We've got a, just a question from the lady. Oh. Hi, Richard. Hello. It's Penny from Maria's office. Um, I'm very fortunate to work with Richard um, as a co-chair of the Parliamentary Friendship Group of Multiculturalism. And I've got to say that they do a wonderful job, all three co-chairs, in promoting yes. multiculturalism in the Australian you Parliament. Might want to, so. so Maria Van Vakenu, yeah. who's the federal member for Cornwall, uh, Russell Broadbent and myself co-chair the Parliamentary Friends of Multiculturalism. So, and we do it in a way... Some of the stuff that actually happens in Parliament isn't, you know, the... We actually do work together sometimes. In fact, a lot of the time. It's the stuff that will never get reported. I, but th I think the good people work together a lot of well, the time. Well, that's true. Yes, yes, yes. yes, yes. <laughs> the ones that have a... a yeah. Anyway, I'll stop there <laughs> because I'm actually here just as a person who's very interested in this area. Um, my concern is, and this question, well, it's not really a question, it's a statement, and I'd like to know how you both feel about it, and it's about the media and how... Because we haven't really talked about how the media, you know, the current... <laughs> with the stories that are going on and how they... You know, attack certain groups and community groups. Um, what can we do moving forward? Will this change? Is it because of the, you know, the quick media cycle at the moment? I don't really have a question, but I'm just, I'm just as a former yeah. journalist, I'm really disheartened about yeah. newspapers and what yeah. I'm reading, and it, you know, it's to the point where yeah. you can't really read them anymore. So yeah. just, just both your thoughts on this. Can I take that first and then you can judge me? Yes. All right. Um, <laughs> there's, I think there's Yes is the answer to all of the various questions you asked. <laughs> um, it's a big, I think it's a big issue. I think, you know, I, the conversation, we're in a very different position. We're, we're working with academics who are writing on these issues. We're able to fact check claims like, you know, African, African gang representation or Victoria being the worst, the, the state with the highest crime in, in Australia. Definitively not true. Not sure where that came from. Um, but I think the thing that we're fighting against and the things that you're seeing, particularly, say, Fairfax, I wouldn't say that... News Corp necessarily is fighting against it, um, is that there's this perception from people within those newsrooms, I think, that, that the community wants to hear about these issues or the community is concerned about these issues. And I think it's why we saw you know, a couple of months ago the, the kind of out of nowhere, I thought, Fairfax uh, in their editorial saying, oh, but African crime is an issue. Um, African youth crime is definitely an issue, which statistically is just not true. And probably someone should have looked at the stats before making that claim in the editorial pages. Um, I, it, I think it's like one of those things where it's a consistent. It, 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 we are we're in a problem where people are looking to data for good reasons and bad reasons. And if you're looking to polling data, then maybe you think you need to talk about something like crime because of some sections of the community. Even though, if you better educated the community and, and used your your role as the media to talk to, about the fact that crime has been pretty flat for about 20 years in Victoria. Um, we have previous you know, police commissioners saying that you know, crime is terrible now, um, and those previous police commissioners were responsible for the most police shootings in all, to uh, all time in Victoria. There's lots of issues um, in regards to that. I think mm -hmm. that the media could be doing a lot better. I also think that we're going through the segmentation problem that the US has gone through over the last 10 to 15 mm -hmm. years, where um, even if you do put out things that uh, rebut or, you know, not even rebut, they just say the facts on these things which happen to rebut a lot of these claims. Um, some people just won't hear it. Um, and even by being a media company that, that is willing to argue with these topics, um, you're seen as the enemy. Um, so the answer is I'm also somewhat pessimistic, but I don't think that that should change uh, people making sure that they are fighting the good fight and Sometimes fighting the good fight is just telling the facts. Um, mm. And the facts are on the side of there not being an issue and, and that they're not... And, and that if there are small pockets of issues, that they'd be better addressed as they have been in the past by actually working with communities. It's very rare that you will hear police uh, organisations saying, argue, effectively arguing they don't need more money. But that's what the police are doing in Victoria at the moment. <laughs> they're saying, we, we've got this handled. Um, so... I don't know. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's my answer. <laughs>
Um, so I suppose if I would say if we're talking media, let's make the distinction between legacy media and online media. So, you know, legacy media, print media, broadcast and so on. Uh, if we're talking about legacy media, in particular print media, we just need to be frank about what's going on. You know, News Limited control most of the uh, print media. Uh, firstly, there's a massive disruption going on within the media. It's changing and changing very fast and people don't know where it's going. The business model that once supported newspapers is breaking down uh, and so it's become a very, very um, uncertain media environment. The number of journalists working in areas, specialised areas, are they're being slashed by the dozens, so there's huge disruption. Bottom line is with print media, news limited control, close to 70% of what people read. And News Limited have a, you know, a, a very clear and explicit uh, right-wing agenda. You know, that is, that is who they are. That's who the proprietor of the paper is and their agenda is a very, very clear one. And so their agenda will always be to advance the interests of conservative governments and therefore it's in their interests because these issues tend to benefit conservative politicians will always get a very sensationalist perspective on it, and that's just the reality. Um, you need to look, I mean, Fairfax is, that's a um, media empire that is radically different to the one it was only a few years ago, and now that the merger with Channel 9's gone through, there are questions about whether Fairfax will continue to exist as a challenger to News Limited's dominance. So that's, I'm not at all pos positive or optimistic about that. We don't know where it's going. Obviously with online media, what you're seeing is you're seeing this um, increasing polarisation where people are in their corners, where people are just basically getting told the stuff that they want to hear in silos. And so there's, you know, one of the things that people saw as an advantage of social media, media is it would cut through the dominance of the key, you know, corporate media players. Actually what seems to be happening is this real polarisation. This is my team. This is the information I want to hear. I'm just getting stuff that reinforces my own opinion. So that's one of the problems with online media. Um, I think there's a question about how we regulate the media space and how we hold people who make, um, you know, factually incorrect uh, and potentially very inflammatory comments, how we hold them to account. And so there's a question about media regulation and whether we've got those settings right. And I don't think we do. Uh, you've got to be careful because a free press is absolutely central to any flourishing democracy, but by the same token, you've got to, that doesn't mean the freedom to denigrate, humiliate, and do all the things that happen as a result of media commentary um, that is completely, you know, that, that where people aren't being held to account. And I suppose finally, some things we need to do is we need to have more people from different backgrounds in the media. We actually need to create spaces and pathways for people to actually hold those positions. So one of the things we recommended as part of this multicultural act inquiry, one of the areas we looked at was media and cadetships, you know, the government having a role in providing training, specific training uh, and pathways for people from, uh, you know, cult different cultural backgrounds. So we see, you know, particularly in our public media, the ABC and SBS, we see more diversity. We see stories coming back that actually reflect Australian diversity, not and I think they're changing and it's starting to happen, but it needs to, happen, needs to accelerate. So I think you've got to do all of those things. I actually don't know where it's going. I really don't. I think we're living through a period of huge change and disruption. And it has the potential to go in many different directions. You, ask, you speak to people in the media and no one can tell you with any certainty about where this is going to end up. What, what, what is going to be the role of newspapers, or, um, you know, print... Uh, uh, you've got the dominance of um, Google and Facebook who are now, you know, play a central role in people getting access to information. Huge disruption going on at the moment. I was going to say, that's the, uh, we have to wrap it up now, but I think the biggest issue for me for, is, that, yeah, it would be great to offer all those cadet shifts and stuff like that. We just need to make sure that there are actual jobs at the, yes. at the end of them because that's the, yes. the biggest Correct. question for the media at the moment. Correct. But, um, Correct. I did want to thank the Australian Intercultural Society for having us and um, everyone. And also for you. Thank you. Thank you.